There are several techniques that are utilized to visualize nucleic acids. One group of techniques are electrophoresis techniques, and these include agarose gel electrophoresis, polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis, two-dimensional gel electrophoresis, as well as capillary gel electrophoresis. There's also blotting techniques, such as dot blots, and then some specific blotting techniques, such as northern, southern, and western blots. We're going to start out by talking about electrophoresis techniques. Agarose electrophoresis is probably one of the more common and widely used visualization methods to see your nucleic acids. And agarose is a polysaccharide that's found in certain types of seaweed. And this polysaccharide is used to make agarose. Agarose comes in a powder form. Electrophoresis is the movement of charged molecules toward an electrode of the opposite charge. So your nucleic acids will always run from the, a negative charge toward a positive charge. And electrophoresis is used in order to separate these charged mo molecules. So Agarose electrophoresis. Agarose is also called gel. It's a gel. So purified agarose, we already said, is in a powder form. This powder has to be solubilized so that you can get your gel. The powder is not soluble at room temperature in either water or buffer. So what happens is you take your, your powder the right amount, for, depending on the concentration of gel you're making, and you put it in a buffer. You always want to put it in the same buffer that you're using to run your electrophoresis. Since it doesn't dissolve in room temperature, you have to boil it, and usually this occurs in a microwave. So you take your powder and buffer mixture, in an Aramire flask and you put it in the microwave and you boil it. The powder will then dissolve in the boiling buffer and you then take it out of the microwave and you allow it to cool. Now you don't want to allow it to cool too much because as this mixture cools it will polymerize. When it polymerizes those sugar polymers will cross-link with one another and that causes the solution to form a gel which is a semi-solid matrix which is similar to jello kind of a squishy jello but agarose gels are more firm than jello is so the more agarose that's dissolved in the boiling liquid the firmer the gel will be the more concentrated the agarose will be now one of the key mistakes that is made a lot of times in the beginning of someone's molecular biology um, laboratory experiences is they will dissolve their agarose powder in water instead of buffer. And it will dissolve and you will be able to make a gel but your nucleic acids are not going to be run through that uh, that gel very well because you really want to use the buffer that you're using in your electrophoresis apparatus. Now making the gel, we already said you take your, let's look at the picture starting on the left, you weigh out your agarose powder. It's important for you to use the right amount of powder to get the concentration of gel that you need for whatever you're looking at. So you weigh out your powder, you add that powder to the appropriate amount of buffer. You then put it in the microwave, you boil that buffer, your agarose powder is going to dissolve. You then want to cool it because you don't want to pour the boiling solution into what's called a casting tray in order to make your gel. You want to cool it a little bit but you don't want to cool it to the point where it actually polymerizes. So you just want to cool it to the touch and then you're going to pour your liquid 
agarose solution into what's called your casting tray. You always want to make sure you add a comb to the casting tray. That's another mistake that is done usually in the beginning is you might forget to add your comb and then you have a gel that has no sample wells. So you need that comb to make your sample wells. And once you pour your liquid in and add your comb, you then let it sit and it, as it cools off it will harden and in the last picture you could see you could pull your comb out and you have your agarose gel with your sample wells in it. So usually if you knew you were running a gel in the laboratory you might make one um, before lunch and then go out for lunch and then come back and your gel is ready to go and then you can use your gel for your electrophoresis reaction. So the components that are essential for electrophoresis, you need an electrophoresis chamber, you need a power supply, some voltage in order to move those negatively charged molecules towards the positive charge. You need your gel casting trays in order to make your gel and these gel casting trays are usually made of a UV transparent plastic. You also have to have your sample combs because you add your sample comb to the liquid um, agar solution, agarose solution, sorry, and then the agarose solution will polymerize around the comb and that's what makes your sample wells. You need electrophoresis buffer. That ele electrophoresis buffer is the buffer that you're going to use to both make your gel and also run your electrophoresis. So the two most commonly used electrophoresis buffers are TAE or tris acetate EDTA or TBE tris borate EDTA. You also need a loading buffer and loading buffers usually contain a dense material such as glycerol. Glycerol is very heavy and it's going to bring your sample into the well. You're, you're actually going to see it drop into the well because that glycerol is much heavier density than the electrophoresis buffer. In addition to glycerol, usually loading buffers have tracking dyes, either one or two. And these tracking dyes serve a dual purpose. One is it allows you to actually see your sample and make sure your sample is falling into the sample well and that all of your sample went into the well and didn't float out into the buffer. It also allows you to track how far along your nucleic acid is running in the gel. So you could actually see the tracking jot dye moving through the gel. And this is very helpful because if you don't have any tracking dye, it's easy to run the gel too long and then all of your nucleic acid can run right out the end of the gel and then you don't have any product. You also need some type of stain in order for you to see your nucleic acids. One of the most common and least expensive stains is ethidium bromide. Now ethidium bromide is a fluorescent dye that is commonly used to stain nucleic acids. However, it's very important that you know that ethidium bromide is a well-known mutagen. It must be hazard handled as a highly hazardous hazardous chemical. So you have to wear gloves whenever you're making ethidium bromide, whenever you're handling anything, a gel buffer that might have come in contact with ethidium bromide, you must wear jet, uh, gloves. It's very important because you don't want that ethidium bromide getting into contact with your skin. It can penetrate your skin and it's a mutagen and can lead to cancer. You also need some type of an ultraviolet light box, which usually is called a trans illuminator. So when you, your ultraviolet light hits the ethidium bromide stained nucleic acid, it fluoresces or lights up. And that's how you can actually visualize your nucleic acids. Here's a schematic of an electrophoresis apparatus and this is what's called a horizontal apparatus. You're, there's always going to be a negative charge on one end, a positive on the other end. 
these are the ends on the outside of the apparatus where you're going to add your cords that are going to come from your uh, voltage, your power supply. You always want to make sure you put the right one on the right end. Your negative on the negative end and your positive on the positive end. You're going to put your gel on the gel loading um, platform and then you're going to fill this apparatus with buffer. So whatever buffer you're using, TAE or TBE. If you made your gel with TBE buffer, you need to make sure you put TBE buffer into your apparatus to run your gel. You always want to make sure you put your gel in the right direction. So if, if you can see in this picture the red gel, the sample well should be closest to the negative end of that apparatus because your DNA is always going to run from the negative to the positive. So here's another mistake that a lot of people will make at least once when they're running gels is they will put the gel in the opposite direction and then all of their nucleic acid runs off the gel. So here are some pictures of electrophoresis and we're going to start at the very left, the very first left picture. You can see that someone is using a pipette min with a pipette tip on it to pick up their sample that has loading buffer. And loading buffer is usually a blue color due to the dye that's, that's in the loading buffer. Your, remember your loading buffer is going to allow you to pull your, bring your sample into your sample wells of your agarose gel. So that's the second picture that that person is loading each well with the appropriate amount of sample. It, depending on what sample you're running, depending how big the gel is, depending how big the wells are, that's going to determine how much sample you put in the well. Sometimes you only put 10 microliters into a well. Sometimes you can put up to 50 microliters or 100 microliters. It all depends on what, what type of assay you're running. The third picture, and oh, I want to say something about loading the gel. So that second picture. It's very important when you're loading a gel not to tilt the pipette tip too much so that you're gouging into the agarose well. Also, you don't want to put your pipette tip into that well too deeply. You just want your pipette tip right over the opening at the top of the well. If you stick your pipette tip all the way down into the well, you can break the bottom of the agarose gel of, of that well, and when you add your sample to it, that glycerol that's bringing your sample in is going to bring it right through the hole and right out, so you won't actually have any sample in your well. You'll see it just disappear. That's another mistake that I think anybody that's ever run an agarose gel has done at least once where they've punctured the bottom of the well. The middle picture is the power supply and with your power supply depending on the size of your gel and what size bands you're looking for and how long you want to run your gel that depends on the voltage, the amount of voltage that you're going to set your power supply on. The next picture in is a gel that an agarose gel that has been electrophoresed. You can see that there are two dye fronts in that gel. The red arrow has kind of a greenish blue um, little dots along the, that gel and then the blue arrow shows a purple dye front. So this will allow you to approximate how far your nucleic acids have run. Each one of those dyes has is a specific size and will run through the gel at a, a specific length of time, a, a specific length per time. So you can approximate how far you have to run your gel. Where do you have to stop the green and purple dye fronts in order for you to get really good separation of your DNA or RNA products. 
the last picture is what you'd actually see after you stain your gel with ethidium bromide and put it under a transilluminator. You're going to see these fluorescing, very bright bands of nucleic acid. So your migration of your DNA. So we talked about this a little bit in the last lecture where we said that circular or supercoiled DNA that's wrapped up really tightly will go through an agarose gel faster than the exact same DNA that's linearized. And it's because the agarose gels have a matrix. So if you have a nice tightly wound or nice circular piece of DNA, it's going to be able to get through that matrix a lot easier than a long linear piece that has to work its way through that matrix. In general, what's important with migration of DNA, larger pieces of DNA are going to run slower than smaller pieces. Nice tight circular pieces of DNA are going to run through a little bit faster. But in general, if you have a circular piece of DNA that's 500 base pairs in length, you have another circular piece of DNA that's 3,000 base pairs in length. The 500 base pair piece is going to run faster than the 3,000 base pair piece, even if they're both circular. So that is really what you need to take out of this migration of DNA. I'm not going to make you do any calculations of, you know, log tens of this and that to figure out where your DNA is going to migrate. You just need to keep in mind that linear DNA runs a little sm slower than the same size DNA that's circular. And in general, larger fragments of DNA are going to run slower than small fragments. So your smaller fragments are going to run further down to the end of the gel. Now how your DNA or RNA, your nucleic acids run through an agarose gel depends a lot on the agarose concentration. So I said in that picture where they were measuring the agarose powder, you are going to make a very specific concentration agarose gel. So it depends on what size fragment you're running. Um, so in general, you want a higher concentration of agarose if you need to separate small DNA fragments. So if you have little pieces of DNA that are only 100 base pairs or 200 base pairs, you want a higher concentration of agarose. If you're running genomic DNA, huge DNA, pieces of DNA, you want a very low concentration of agarose. Even if you have larger pieces of DNA that are 10,000 bases, you want to use a lower concentration of agarose to be able to visualize and separate the larger pieces of DNA compared to if you're looking at 100 or 200 base pair DNA fragments. So here's a, a slide that shows the same DNA fragments run the same time in three different agarose gel concentrations. So as you can see, the larger fragments, the larger fragments are going to be the fragments at the very top of your gel. They are separated out. The, res the resolution is much better in the lower percent agarose, so the 0.7% agarose compared to the 1.5% agarose. The smaller fragments 
are going to be resolved and separated out better on the higher concentration, the 1.5% compared to the low concentration. This is a very important concept to understand. You will have a question on this on your quiz, and there likely will be at least one or two questions on this on your midterm exam. So it's really not necessarily something that you absolutely have to memorize if you can understand that large pieces are going to run through the gel smaller and you're going to be able to separate larger pieces better on a lower concentration of agros and then the opposite is true for small pieces in that picture where that little white zigzaggy line is those are showing the three bands in each gel where your 1000 base pair fragment is so you can see even though these were run at the same for the same amount of time the 1000 base pair fragment runs further down into the gel in the lower concentration gel than it can move in the same amount of time in the higher concentration gel. Now voltage, as the voltage is increased, your nucleic acids are going to move through the gel faster. So the larger frat fragments are going to migrate proportionally faster than the smaller fragments. So it's really important for you to have the appropriate concentration of agarose when you're considering what type of fragments you need to visualize, what size, and also how much voltage do you need. You don't want to crank up the voltage so fast that you run your nucleic acids through that Gel, agarose gel so quickly that the DNA starts to get sheared and it, it just it doesn't look good. It'll smear through the gel. So you want to make sure you use an, a reasonable voltage to get your nucleic acids through the gel at a nice pace, not too fast. Slower is actually always a little bit better. So the best resolution of fragments that are larger than 2 kb or 2000 kilobases is attained by applying no more than 5 volts per centimeter. And the centimeter value is the distance between the two electrodes, not the length of that gel. And again, I'm not going to have you do calculations to determine your voltage or your migration. Just I think the concept of higher voltage, faster you're going to run your nucleic acids through a gel. And there is such a thing as running them too fast. Now the buffer. I already mentioned the two most commonly used buffers especially for DNA electrophoresis is tris acetate EDTA or tris borate EDTA, TAE or TBE. Now your DNA runs a little differently depending on which buffer you use, but you can still do your agros with either TAE or TE, T, TBE. What's most important is if you make your gel with TAE, you want to run your electrophoresis in TAE buffer. The same thing for TBE. Now the buffers, of course, are going to establish pH, just like all buffers do, but they also provide ions to support conductivity. You want that conductivity because you want your nucleic acids to move from the negative charge to the positive charge. So a mistake that, another mistake that is commonly made in the beginning when people are running gels is they will fill the electrophoresis apparatus up with water instead of buffer. Now if you use water in the gel apparatus instead of buffer, you're not going to get good conductivity, so you're not going to get very good migration of the DNL, DNA through that agarose gel. Um, also keep in mind if I said it's there is such a thing of running a gel too fast or having the voltage too high. 
So there are some problems that can occur. If you put the voltage way too high, it can get hot and you can start to melt your agarose. Also, if you use a buffer that's too concentrated and you're adding the heat with the voltage, you can melt your agarose. So you usually are going to run your gel in a 1x concentration of buffer. Now ethidium bromide, we already talked about that a little bit, that fluorescent dye that intercalates between the bases of the nucleic acids. It's a nice way to look at your DNA fragments. Um, there's several ways you can look at your DNA. So what one way is when you make your agarose gel, you put your powder into the buffer and you boil it, you let it cool a bit. When it's cooling, you can add your ethidium bromide then, mix the solution, and then pour your gel in your casting tray. You are then going to have your gel that already contains your ethidium bromide. So then you run your electrophoresis, you take that gel out, and you immediately put it on the transilluminator to look at your DNA fragments. The other way you can do it is you can run, you can pour your gel, run your electrophoresis, and then you can take that gel out, put it into a, uh, on a shaker that contains a tray that contains a, an ethidium bromide solution, and the, you stick your gel in it and allow it to, gently swish around into the ethidium bromide solution and the ethidium bromide will get into your agarose gel attached to your DNA and then after an appropriate uh, time you can go take your gel out and look at it under the transilluminator. So there are pros and cons of each one of these methods. So for staining your gel with ethidium bromide it's it's nice because you don't have this ethidium bromide solution that can possibly get dumped over or spilled accidentally. But you always have to remember using to use gloves when you're carrying this gel from the gel box to the transilluminator. You need to wipe wipe everything off, clean everything appropriately. Um, by staining your gel in an ethidium bromide solution, there are things to keep in mind. The ethidium bromide solution has to be pretty fresh. You have to make that solution at the right concentration. You can over stain your gel. So usually there's a formula. You want to make your ethidium bromide at the right concentration. You want to put your gel in there and you have to incubate your gel for 15 minutes up to 30 minutes depending on the concentration of the ethidium bromide. So if you don't have a high enough ethidium bromide concentration, if the ethidium bromide has gotten old and there's not enough in the solution anymore, or if you don't keep your gel in the solution long enough, you can possibly not stain your gel and then you won't be able to visualize any DNA. So these are all things you have to keep in mind when you're doing agarose gel electrophoresis. Some other electrophoresis methods that we won't talk about in as much detail because most of them have the basic theory um, of an agarose gel electrophoresis. There's just some, some differences between them and they're used for different things. So in pulse field gel electrophoresis or what's called PFGE, this is where your direction of your current flow is altered periodically. So think of regular agarose gel electrophoresis that we just talked about. Your nucleic acids are running basically linearly from the negative charge to the positive. Well in pulse field they're running in one direction and then it the direction changes and then they run in another direction and then it changes again they run in another direction. This allows you to fractionate or resolve 
very large pieces of DNA. So you can actually separate out DNA that's 50,000 to 5 million base pairs. You cannot separate out that size DNA on a regular standard horizontal agarose gel apparatus. Now uh, alkaline agarose gels are prepared with and the electrophoresis is done in buffers that contain an alkaline reagent, sodium hydroxide. So this, these are useful for analyzing single-stranded DNA as opposed to double-stranded DNA. Another type of electrophoresis is polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. Now polyacrylamide might be used instead of agarose gels because you can separate out especially small tiny fragments better using polyacrylamide gel than you can in agarose. Um, so your polyacrylamide gels, you get a, a sharply defined band, a little sharper than your agarose gels. And again, it, they're mainly used in DNA for um, looking at and separating out very tiny pieces of DNA. So here's a picture of a polyacrylamide gel that has DNA in it. And it's very similar to an agarose gel. Polyacrylamide gels are very, very thin. Agarose gels are much thicker. And polyacrylamide gels are run in a vertical apparatus as opposed to the horizontal apparatus. Now, polyacrylamide gel gels are more commonly used to look at proteins. And when you run proteins on polyacrylamide, usually this is called an SDS page. Page is polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. So the SDS is a detergent called sodium dodecyl sulfate. And what that does is it denatures the proteins and coats the proteins with a negative charge. You then use your polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis to separate out and run your negatively charged proteins toward the positive charge. So here, a protein that's folded up before the SDS. You have your hydrophobic regions, your hydrophilic regions. You have various charges and hydrogens. After the SDS, the protein unfolds. It becomes linearized, and it becomes coated with a negative charge. For the SDS page gels, the migration is not determined by the intrinsic electrical charge, but by the molecular weight of the polypeptide. And there are two different buffer systems that can be used to run your SDS page. One is a continuous buffer system where there's only a single gel and you it's very similar to an agarose gel. You make your polyacrylamide gel using the same buffer that you're going to run your gel in. And usually that buffer is your TAE or your TBE. Now there's also a discontinuous system. So in the discontinuous system, you have different layers of gel. So you have a stacking gel, which is not as restrictive. It's a very large poured, pours as an opening gel. And then that is layered on top of what's called a separating or resolving gel. And the resolving gel has much smaller pores, and that's where you get your separation of your different fragments. Each one of those gels, the stacking gel and the resolving gel, is made with a different buffer. And the tank buffer, the buffer you're going to run in, in the electrophoresis apparatus, are different than both of those gel buffers. 
So the resolution or, or the, the fragment separation that you can get in your discontinuous system is better than what you get in your continuous system. So the continuous polyacrylamide gel system is more commonly used without any SDS and it's used a lot of times for DNA. So you can see much crisper DNA bands. The discontinuous system is much more commonly used with your SDS and with your proteins. Now with your polyacrylamide gel, your essential reagents are an acrylamide, bisacrylamide stock solution. You need your running buffer. You always need some sort of, you know, your, your running buffer that you're going to run your gel in. You can have your stacking gel buffer. Remember, there's two different buffers. You have your SDS detergent. You have ammonium persulfate, which is an initiator solution. You have your tank buffer. Again, different buffer than your two um, gel buffers. You have a treatment buffer. You have a reducing buffer. You have beta mercaptoethanol. And you also have molecular markers. So SDS page is run in a vertical apparatus instead of a horizontal apparatus, but it's got a very similar theory. Your negative electrode runs along the top and your positive runs along the bottom. Your um, sample, whether it's DNA or proteins, are going to run from the top where your wells are through the down to the bottom of that gel. And on the left-hand schematic, you could see that stacking system, the discontinuous st uh, system, where you have your stacking gel on the top, which is, has very large pores, and then your running gel on the bottom, where you're going to get very good separation, where your larger proteins are going to be up higher, and your smaller proteins are going to be down further in that vertical gel. So here is an actual um, polyacrylamide vertical gel apparatus. So you have the little holder inside that holds your polyacrylamide gel upright. Usually your polyacrylamide gel is made between two thin pieces of glass. Your polyacrylamide gel is thin, thin, thin. It's like a little piece of film. You have combs in this gel, you make wells in the top, you have to pour your gel just like you would an agarose gel, but it's all done vertically instead of horizontally and it's much thinner. Once your gel polymerizes, you pull your comb out, you put your apparatus inside the tank, you fill your tank up with your buffer, you've got your wires that are running to your power source, you make, always want to make sure your negative or the black cord is in the black, the negative spot in the red cord is in the positive electrode location. And on the right hand side, that's an actual picture of proteins that have already been run and then stained on an SDS page gel. Another type of, de of gel is two-dimensional gel electrophoresis or 2D gel electrophoresis. So what in 2D gel electrophoresis, it starts out off in your typical one-dimensional electrophoresis of your proteins. And then you separate further by running 90 degrees in the opposite direction from the first um, electrophoresis. So, in other words, your analytes or your protein products are spread out in a two-dimensional surface instead of in a vertical line. So, it's less likely that your two protein products or analytes will be the same in both of these directions, both properties. So you are going to be able to separate out your analytes a lot better 
using a two-dimensional electrophoresis than a single-dimensional electrophoresis. Here is a 2D gel apparatus, somewhat similar to the polyacrylamide gel apparatus where you have a vertical system, but there are some major differences that allow it to run in one dimension and then run in the opposite direction. So here is a cartoon of two-dimensional electrophoresis where you start off in one area. Instead of going straight down what you would expect, you then get pulled over and you're not directly underneath where you started off. You're over to the left or the right depending on how you're running your gel. And here is an actual picture of a finalized run and stained 2D gel. And every single spot on this gel represents a different protein. So what you would want to do is, let's say we're comparing two different um, samples, you would want to compare these spots and find where there's a difference. So find where there might be a spot in one and not the other. You can then cut that little spot out of the gel and you can then send it for, for other analyses to find out what that protein is. Capillary gel electrophoresis is similar to your traditional gel electrophoresis, although it's done in a small little capillary tube. So you have your polymers in your solution that generates what's similar to a sieve, and that is similar and replaces that physical agarose gel. So analytes that have a similar charge to mass ratios are resolved by their size. So this is usually used, your capillary gel electrophoresis is used to analyze proteins um, similar to that SDS page gel. So it uses the molecular weight analysis of proteins like the SDS page and then the sizing applications that are more like your DNA properties. And here's your capillary gel electrophoresis. So capillary electrophoresis is more commonly done in automated instruments. So this isn't something you're going to do on the bench top. If you're doing something on the bench top, it's going to be an agarose gel, a polyacrylamide gel, or an SDS polyacrylamide gel. Capillary gel, there's instrumentation that um, will take your sample and pull it through the capillary and you can get your results usually off of a computer. We are um, next going to go to blotting. So the most common types of blotting methods are the southern blot, the northern blot, and the western blot. And the main differences between these are the southern blot is used to analyze DNA. Your DNA is cut with enzymes called restriction enzymes. You then run your cut DNA on an on agarose gel, you then um, pull, put your cut DNA and uh, transfer them from the gel to a membrane, and then you're going to use probes that are labeled in some way to attach the appropriate um, areas on your membrane. The all of these are done very similarly, where you have a gel, you run it out, you separate a product, and then you blot that uh, product from the gel onto a membrane, and then you're going to probe with something. So again, a southern blot is DNA. A northern blot is used to look at RNA, and a western blot is used to look at protein. 
So your steps to blotting, you're always going to do some sort of gel electrophoresis, whether it's an SDS page or a regular agarose gel electrophoresis. You're going to start out by taking your product and running it on a gel. You're then going to transfer your product that's in your gel to a solid support, which is usually a membrane of some kind. And depending on what you're doing, you're going to use a very specific type of a membrane. You are then going to block out the mem membrane so the only thing that is coming through is your product in through that membrane. You're then going to uh, label in some way, whether it's chemiluminescence or radioactivity or colorimetric, a probe. You're going to then bathe your membrane with that probe. If you have um, a region that the probe recognizes and can bind to, you then, that's called hybridization, you then are going to wash the membrane so you're washing that probe off and the only place the probe is going to stay onto is the area that it hybridized or attached to and then you need to do some sort of detection method so that you can visualize where that probe is lighting up. So your separation of your nucleic acids based on molecular weight. So your DNA, your molecular weight is measured in base pairs or in kilo base pairs. One kilobase is 1,000 bases. Your RNA molecular weight is measured in nucleotides or kilonucleotides, one nucleotide is, I mean, 1,000 nucleotides is one kilonucleotide. Proteins molecular weight is in daltons or grams per mole or in kilodaltons. So 1,000 kilodaltons is equal to one dalton. Your transfer step, so after your DNA, RNA, or protein is separated by its molecular weight in the electrophoresis system, it's transferred to the solid support before that hybridization because hybrid, hybridizing your probe doesn't work well in a gel, so you need that, that solid support. So when you are transferring your material to that um, membrane, that is the process of blotting. So that solid support I said is going to vary depending on what you're doing. Commonly it is nitrocellulose paper, which really looks almost like a piece of um, a, a finer construction paper. DNA, RNA, and protein all stick really well to the nitrocellulose paper in a sequence independent manner. Blocking, I told you that the surface of that nitrocellulose membrane is um, has molecules on it and then it has space where there aren't anything. So you run your gel and there are areas that have product and areas that do not have product. So you first have to block out the areas that you don't have any molecules or else your probe would go in and just stick all over the place. So you have to block the entire filter all the blank areas so that the probe can get to the areas that have actual molecules and product and stick or hybridize when it finds the correct area as opposed to hybridizing to all the areas of the membrane that don't have any molecules at all. So you've, you take your nitrocellulose paper that's already been blotted and contains your products and you block it with your blocking solution. Then you want to add your probe and again it could be a radioactively labeled probe, a fluorescently labeled probe, and or a chemiluminescently labeled probe. 
So here is a schematic of a southern blot. You have your DNA that you load into your agarose gel, just like a normal agarose gel electrophoresis with your loading buffer. You run it using your power supply and your buffers for the appropriate amount of time. Now if you look at that second little picture in from the left, you always run a marker. It doesn't matter what type of gel you're running, whether it is polyacrylamide, agarose, it doesn't matter. You always want to use some sort of sizing marker. The marker should always be there, so if your marker isn't there, it means something happened, something's wrong, maybe you didn't stain the gel properly. So that marker is going to allow you to know, okay, my electrophoresis worked, I see my, my staining worked, I see my marker, and then you can compare the sizes in your marker to whatever bands you see. So you absolutely have to have a marker, at least on one end of your gel. You run your gel, and then you do your blot. So you take your gel, you take your nitrocellulose filter paper, you then take a bunch of other filter paper and paper towels and you soak that all in a salt solution and you put a heavy weight on the top. And by capillary action from that salt solution, your products that are in your gel, and for a southern blot it's going to be DNA, are going to move up from the gel by gravity flow up into the nitrocellulose membrane. Once it gets into the nitrocellulose membrane, it can't move any further. So then you see your DNA is now transferred onto your nitrocellulose filter and it's not in the gel anymore. You then need to block your filter to remove, to bind up all of the area that doesn't have any molecules so that your probe doesn't hybridize to those areas. You then want to hybridize with your probe and the probe is only going to bind, so in this case a radioactive or chemiluminescently, this case is radioactive labeled probe, binds to a specific sequence and if that sequence is present in the DNA it will bind to that piece of DNA on the filter. You then wash to remove all of the probe that didn't bind and then in radioactively labeled probes you're going to uh, expo do an exposure using x-ray film and you're look, going to look at the final product on the film, which is called an autorad or an autoradiogram, and you can see your marker, and you can see where the probes bound to on your gel. Now, dot blots is a, is is this very similar to a blot but it's a little more simplified so it's a technique that you can use to detect biomolecules you can use a dot blot instead of a northern a southern or a western um, blot but the main difference is that the biomolecules to be detected are not separated out so you don't do that electrophoresis and then the blot Usually what you're going to do is you're going to take your sample and you are going to apply it directly onto your membrane as a little dot. So you would take a small amount, you know, 5 microliters, 10 microliters, depending on the size of your paper and what assay you're doing. You're going to drop little dots of your sample all along this membrane and you're going to do the very same, a similar thing. You want to block it, you want to probe it, you want to wash it, and you want to detect it. So the advantage is that you save time because you don't do the electrophoresis and you don't do that blotting with the gravity flow that takes a long time. You usually have to blot it at least overnight unless you're using a vacuum system or another faster system. The diff disadvantage, though, is you don't know the size of your molecule. You just get a spot that lights up. So that's a disadvantage. So it depends on what you need to detect. If you only need to see if something's there or not, 
a dot blot is perfectly fine. If you need to see if it's there and exactly what size it is, then you'd want to do the full northern, southern, or western blot. So here on the left is kind of a schematic of a dot blot and on the right is an actual result of a dot blot where you spot your sample and you do your probing and where you get a nice dark circular uh, dot that would be positive in that location. So it's really important for you to dot your your sample in a very specific pattern so you know oh well the C1 location didn't really light up so that's a negative so whatever sample I put in that location is negative so that's it for our um, visualization methods and um, if there are some concepts in there that are a little difficult to understand I would suggest reading the textbook and also looking at some of the links that I posted on Blackboard.